Hi, welcome to Ability Fierce. Today we have a really special guest, Assembly Member Robert Carroll. And as a lot of you people who have been following the show know, this show grew out of my experiences with my son Nick trying to get into Purchase University and live in the dorms. And when Purchase told us they would not accommodate him and his aides so he could live in the dorms, I really didn't know what to do. So I ran to Robert Carroll's office and I told him the story. And as soon as I told him the story, he was on our side and he was helping us. And he was shouting on the phone to Purchase and he was with us when we talked to the news and all sorts of things. But more than anything he did practically, he was there for us when we felt so alone. And that really helped. And as we got to talking, Robert told us um, that he also had a disability, which is different from my son's disability, which is cerebral palsy. But Bobby, as he likes to be called, um, suffered from dyslexia. And now he has a bill before the state assembly to create a task force on dyslexia that will have serious recommendations that will then become part of the curriculum and the way that the um, schools in the state treat dyslexia. So. Hi, Bob. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Mike, thank you so much for having me, and it's wonderful to be here. And, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing this show, and Ability Fierce is such a wonderful name um, for the show. And, you know, my work with you and your son, Nick, um, you know, gave me so much uh, perspective on, um, you know, how folks out in the world who have disabilities, especially um, disabilities that are readily apparent um, to the naked eye, you know, how much they struggle and how much they have to fight to get the, just the most basic access um, to uh, our public life, be it to live in the dorms at SUNY Purchase, be it to get on the subway, be it to go to work. And that got us thinking about dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was a young man, when I was a young boy, I struggled mightily to learn how to read. Um, and it's massively misunderstood. And I was lucky enough that I had some tenacious and smart parents who were able to get me evaluated um, and then be able to get me the resources and the help so that I could be a fluent and fluid reader, so I could go to college and law school and be here today. And the unfortunate thing is dyslexia is very, very common. Um, you know, one in five people will uh, be affected by it in some way, shape, or form. And it's on a continuum, so it affects some people more than others. Um, and the unfortunate thing is the way we teach reading in New York City and New York State is um, completely wrong for the way a dyslexic person learns how to read. And that's what hopefully this bill will do, is, is to make sure that we identify dyslexic students and then we take the r proper curriculum interventions um, so that every single student in our schools can be a fluent and fluid reader by the time they leave elementary school. About 40% of people mm -hmm. um, will learn how to read with no instruction mm -hmm. because they're phonologically very aware. So that's your son or daughter who at three years old, you go, oh, they must be the next Einstein. They're starting to read. Dyslexic folks um, are not phonologically aware at all. Um, and so they have a very hard time. And it's not correlated to intelligence. But because of that, what happens is, you know, we're naturally predisposed. Okay, now we're in kindergarten, first grade, we're going over these things. And we see 40% of the class really kind of moving fast. Mm -hmm. And then we see probably that middle part, okay, they're picking it up. We're introducing them to letters, we're introducing them to books, and they start putting it together. I and mean, then there's this bottom 15, 20% of the class that's not doing it at all. And you know, then that, those are the those are the dumb kids. Those are the lazy kids. Um, and in actuality, what they are, they're the kids who need the most instruction, um, and and very specific instruction. That instruction is usually called multisensory sequential phonics. So it is multisensory. So it's uh, it's sound, shape, symbol. It is touching, drawing things in the air. It's feeling it in your mouth. It's very specific about that. It's also sequential. So every you know, exercise, every lesson leads to the next one. You had devoted parents, you had active parents. Yeah. And this is something I see again and again. If you have a kid with a disability and your parents can afford to be active, they can access a lot of benefits and help the kids a lot. But a lot of kids just fall by the wayside because the parents don't have time, the will, or even the, some people are too timid to even try to access things and, and advocate for your kids. And this is what one of the things I said when I started the show is I'm going to learn about this stuff so other people don't have to 
uh, do the whole thing again. And that's the, the thing is I'm trying to eliminate that imbalance so that kids who have dyslexia can have just average parents. So I was very lucky. I had very active parents. I had a great first grade teacher who said, your son Bobby is smart. If I ask him a question, he's got a good vocabulary. He knows what's going on. He can't say the ABCs. Mm -hmm. There's an issue here. This is, I bet you he's dyslexic. And my parents had the means to go get me um, a neuropsych evaluation, which is very expensive and takes over two days, two full days to do. Mm -hmm. um, this bill would mandate um, an early childhood dyslexia screener. So it's not a neuropsych. It's not a, you know, a full evaluation. But there are some great, um, readily available, affordable, with proven psychometric screeners that classroom teachers can fill out. And they can then divvy kids up into two groups, at risk, not at risk of being dyslexic. And so it won't be perfect, but we'll get a lot more of those kids where we say, okay, these kids we think are gonna need these interventions. And you can do it as early as first grade. Mm -hmm. And so you can suddenly start saying, okay, we know that Johnny or Sarah needs a little bit more intervention because we think they might be at risk of being dyslexic. Um, and it's also, it's affordable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the schools can do these things for about a buck where, you know, if you go to an outside evaluator, you could spend $5,000, $10,000. And that's just not in um, a, a possibility for so many parents, nor should it have to be. Um, and so, you know, I think um, our schools, we know, we can now identify dyslexia mm -hmm. very cheaply and easily. And we know what the right curriculum interventions are supposed to be. So our public schools really need to be taking hold of that information and using it and implementing it in the lower grades. The uh, New York City public school system has done right now is say, if you're sophisticated or affluent or both and your child is dyslexic, you will be able to use the federal law, the IDEA, mm -hmm. um, to sue so your child can get the free appropriate public education that they're entitled to. Uh, and I totally understand why parents do that because they're entitled to that free appropriate public education and they're not receiving it at their local public school. But what the Board of Ed has done, which is highly cynical, is saying we only know a small percentage of people are going to um, express that right and use that and go to court and get that for themselves. And we know that the vast majority, 95, 98 percent of dyslexic children will never do this. Mm -hmm. And so instead, we're going to pretend it's a problem that doesn't exist or we're going to play around the margins and go, oh, we'll maybe give you a little bit of... Uh, you know, phonics instruction here, or we'll give you a little bit of uh, extra reading time here, but never actually address the root problem. And when you look at schools where there are reading uh, uh, scores that say that 70, 80, 90 percent of the children are reading below grade level, there's a crisis here. Mm -hmm. Easily 15, 20, maybe 25 percent of the kids in that school are dyslexic in some way, shape, or form. One of the things about dyslexia is I will, you know, always probably read a little slower than the average person. Probably not gonna win the spelling bee. Um, but outside of that, right, dyslexia is very much something that is completely, you can completely overcome it, right? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can become a fluid and fluent reader. Um, you can go to college, graduate school. You can, you know, there are great writers, great attorneys, great um, doctors um, in all fields um, who are dyslexic and the, the difference between those people being successful um, and the people who are not successful usually was the proper curriculum interventions early on. We tend to focus on the successful people, and that's good because you have role models yeah. and you have examples. But the people who are left behind, they can't get jobs. They may be treated some of their behavior patterns because they can't get the reading. They get medicated for ADHD or some yeah. other problem. And then they become classified as stupid people, they don't become successful, they may become marginal in society or go, resort to crime because they're not be able to have the opportunities and they feel stigmatized by the whole experience. So something like this, a program like this, helps not only to create doctors and, and um, uh, you know, scientists and other people with dyslexia, but just average people who can get a job, hold down a job, be a contributing uh, right. member of society. My, my girl, I, again, I couldn't agree more. I mean, there are studies out there that say that somewhere around 50% of the prison population is dyslexic. Right. Um, and because, right, here's a, a group of individuals, uh, mostly young men, who go and say, I'm failing out of school. They are smart. They do have ability. Um, and they go, well, where can I go 
and where are the best opportunities for me? And it suddenly becomes in gangs, in violence, um, in theft, and it destroys lives. It destroys community, it destroys families. There's lots of reasons that our pr criminal justice system needs reform, um, but definitely um, the problem with early childhood education is part of that problem. The, the costs are gonna be there no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, we can decide if we wanna have upfront costs of saying educating folks uh, so that they can leave their best lives, mm -hmm. or we're gonna pay for those costs through prisons and lack of jobs and lack uh, and need of government assistance down the road. So we can either pay it up front mm -hmm. or we can pay it down the road. We're gonna pay for it no matter what. And so, you know, I think paying for it up front will, in fact, be cheaper in the mm -hmm. long run, produce a happier, healthier, more productive society. Because, um, you know, if your son Nick wasn't able to go to purchase, if I wasn't able to learn how to read, you know, there are real opportunity costs to that. Mm -hmm. And those costs aren't just in dollars and cents on a, how much do we spend on education or how much do we spend on transportation this year in the state budget. It's um, the value of our neighborhoods. It's the value of the things that we produce, Nick and I uh, and others of who've had experience like ours in the future. And that I think is really, really important. And when schools um, or transportation or dormitories or these things that are supposed to be public for everyone basically say, well, the way you're hardwired doesn't fit with our public school, public transportation, public dormitory, you go, well, that's unfair. Mm -hmm. And that needs to change because there are tons of people. Um, the world is full of people um, who are different. Uh, in a whole host of ways. And that finally, I'm not a lover of Silicon Valley or mm -hmm. Wall Street, um, but one of the biggest things that they're doing uh, when they're interviewing people is something they call neurodiversity, mm -hmm. um, is trying to get people who they think think differently mm -hmm. um, and attack problems differently because they realized that some of their best successes were having people on teams that thought differently and looked at the world differently. And, you know, they're spending lots and lots of money on, you know, trying to evaluate people's neurodiversity. Um, and, of course, people who have um, any form of disability or difference, they naturally, from the get-go, kind of face the world in a different way and had to figure out unique ways to navigate it for themselves. And I think this bill, your show, I mean, is to try to make that a little bit easier so that that becomes the commonplace. That, mm -hmm. You know, when you go to the local public school, when you go to the dormitory, when you go to the subway station, it's already built in, it's baked in, um, that we're taking that into account. One of the things that I see is there's, I, I like to call it Governor Cuomo's covert war on the disabled. So they're saying, well, we have to make these cuts. And I'm saying, you're harming people. All of these cuts, it's not, your, you're not saving money or you're, you're hurting people's lives. You're damaging people's lives. How do we alert people to this and how do we change it so they understand that they should be investing in these people instead of harming them? So, um, you know, one of the biggest things we're facing this year on the state budget is it's a six billion dollar budget deficit that the governor's office is reporting. Um, and I'll be up there later this week and that'll be the, the topic of conversation. Um, and that six billion dollar deficit is largely due to Medicaid mm -hmm. um, spending. Um, we can't allow for these cuts to happen. Um, it, it's pretty simple. Um, we need to figure out how to close that budget hole without hurting our most vulnerable New Yorkers. The unfortunate thing I would say is there's a lot of cynicism out there. Um, behind closed doors, um, be it for an e-hail program, be it for, um, you know, a, um, you know, program of how people can then, you know, kind of live their lives with AIDS and, how, you know, have a, have a self-directed, um, you know, plan. Um, lots of people behind closed doors think all of these things are charity, uh, and they're not. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same thing that we deal with with the DOE about changing curriculum, mm -hmm. is they think it's charity. Well, you know what? Most kids, we think, will do it this way. Most people will do it this way. Mm -hmm. And so you should be happy whatever crumbs we get um, on the other side. Um, and that is just, um, it is the height of cynicism. It is um, absolutely terrible. Um, and it's because those people 
don't value the people who are taking those services. They say, well, they're not really productive members of society. They're not really, um, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if they get to work. It doesn't matter if they get to whatever. You know, it can take them four hours. What else are they doing? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's downright disgusting. Mm -hmm. I, I rarely quote George W. Bush, uh, but he used this term, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think there is a lot of that. And that's why when these budget cuts happen, people kind of, you know, they kind of throw up their hands and go, well, we're already, you know, we're, we're trying, you know, as if we are, you know, um, a charity connected to a church or something where you go, well, we didn't collect enough money on Sunday and we, we can't run the soup kitchen. That's not what we're talking about here. Um, and, you know, we need people like yourself uh, and people throughout New York State to say, you know, these are vital services um, and these are your these are your neighbors, your kids, your parents, um, and we can't see these cuts. And it could cuts. be you. Yeah. It that's, could, that's, yes, and it could be, the yeah. One, the one thing is there's nothing to say that after you leave a legislative session, the icy road doesn't leave you with a spinal injury. 100%. It, you know, and I think, and I, the other big problem I have is the bureaucracy. It's an incredibly complex bureaucracy, and it doesn't have to be so. It shouldn't be so. Um, so the people who are adept at negotiating the bureaucracy get more services than the people who can't figure it out. And there's very little effort made to help people figure it out. So. And I, what I would say is it, they do that on purpose mm -hmm. um, because they want to. I mean, this is, this is the entire cynical nature of whether you're a parent trying to advocate for additional services for your dyslexic child or uh, DOE or you're a person with a physical disability that you're trying to figure out the e-hail program or the self-direction program or social security, all of these systems are set up in a way that they want a certain amount of people to say either this is overwhelming, I can't do it, I can't figure it out, um, or people just don't even try. Um, and it is truly, truly um, repugnant and ridiculous. There is no, you're 100% correct, there is no reason um, you know, up until the de Blasio administration, um, every year, children who were dyslexic or had other uh, learning disabilities uh, similar to it, every year had to get evaluated. Every year. For what re This is not going oh, away. Right, right. Um, you know, there, and there are countless stories that you've told me, um, you know, with when we were fighting about getting the self-direction program for Nick uh, at SUNY Purchase specifically, that they just... Um, it, they're shocking. You know, they, they, they make no, there's no common sense. And all it's done is to try to kind of box people in and hopefully have enough people just kind of opt out mm -hmm. um, and lose will. And it's, it's, it's really nasty because it's, it's, a way to, it's a way to cut costs. I mean, that's what it's for. I mean, it's baked right. in there to, 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 to cut costs and liability. But what you said before, which was um, exactly, you pay the cost. It doesn't cut costs. It cuts costs at the... Yeah, it cuts costs at this very moment, point, not, not, not later on. For, yeah. yeah, Because it costs, for a person who goes to prison, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's um, maybe wrong. Someone will... On, Internet it's, world. It's I think over, it's like a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, it's it's yeah, yeah. it's it's, it's and astronomical. It's, and institutionalizing somebody with a disability is also astronomical. Yeah. Except that they don't live that long in the institution. You see, so it's a cynical. And it destroys, of course, also their families, right. their lives afterwards. You know, I mean, it, it, it is it is devastating not just to them, but I mean to entire communities. Um, and you know, it's something that that needs to be stopped. Mm -hmm. So how do we stop it? How do we make people aware that this is a short-sighted thing that's really impacting badly on so many people and on society as a whole? You know, I, I look, I think the, the advocates themselves, right? I think parents, mm -hmm. I think people who have disabilities and the, and the wide diversity of what those disabilities are um, are so important in putting a human face on it. If it's just um, lawyers and courtrooms or members of the legislature, it will it will it will continue um, to kind of have this stigma of charity, and it's okay. We got this much this time. You should be happy. Oh well, we've got a ne next year's budget. We've got to see. Where if people start realizing that it's it could be you, mm -hmm. it's your coworker, it's your husband or wife, it's your son or daughter, it's this big group of people that we are basically pigeonholing. Um, into a life um, that is not complete and full. 
I think a lot more will be done because we would never, um, you know, go out there and say, um, well, you know what, we're deciding at pre-K who can go to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, we've decided we're going to do a thing and just 50 or 60 percent of you are going to, everyone would be up in arms. Well, and it's adversarial in nature almost. Right. And I think that's one of the problems. Whenever I think we see things um, that are kind of broken uh, in our in our government um, and at large, a lot of times it's because of how adversarial it is. And, and I think that comes back to kind of the foundations of our laws and our legal system. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, there are good times when it's adversarial, when you're trying to defend yourself or when you're saying, you know what, I disagree. Okay, I understand why you'd want to be able to mm -hmm. have it. But when we take that kind of adversarial nature and we bake it into something as simple as getting services for a person who clearly has a documented disability, be whatever it is, and we make them jump through every hoop and kind of reinvent the wheel every time, we go, that makes no sense. Um, because once you've kind of shown that you need those services, and once you've shown that this is the thing, you know, we should then do everything in our power to say, okay, how are we going to keep the trains running on time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for that person and not make them go through um, basically, um, you know, reapplications and all these things. You know, there's there there there's lots of misnomers out there that there's like fraud and these things, and it's just really not true. Um, and you know, every program does have some bad actors, but there's much easier ways to kind of audit that and to look at that um, than to presume everybody is fraud. Yeah, exactly. Right, right now, when you apply for benefits or services, they almost assume you're trying to fraud the system. Yeah. It's, it's very insulting. It's, it's, and, it, and some people are so timid that that's enough to stop them yeah. from accessing it. Once somebody is qualified for a service, mm -hmm. um, you know, medical doctors, um, you know, there are things like, look, having CP, having dyslexia, two totally different things, neither of them go away. Mm -hmm. Um, and so why should you have to re re yeah. reapply? Um, and it, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a good medical evaluation of either at the beginning. But what it should not happen. And look, it, it happened to me. I remember I got evaluated every year when I was in grammar school. It wasn't, I remember rebelling one mm -hmm. time and refusing to take the test mm -hmm. because it was like, you're going to sit me through like two days of testing again. Mm -hmm. Like, what is the point of this? Um, and there's absolutely no reason. And that is where I think, re and, and this is where the legislature I, um, can be really thoughtful, right? There are places where we can say, look, right, if, if you're in a court of law and you're in a lawsuit or a criminal court, you want this to be adversarial. You have two sides saying there are two different things or disputing a fact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once you get a medical record early on that says this person has X, why are we going to dispute whether they have X every year or three years or five or whatever it is makes absolutely no sense and it is it is damaging and that also um, costs that these these audits cost money yeah you know what i mean it's not you yeah they're not free yeah you know we're spending a, we're yeah, paying yeah. bureaucrats when though when those monies could be spent on helping individuals mm -hmm. on actually providing the services that we need mm -hmm. um i am always a big proponent of um you know i'm not about you know just cutting government spending to cut government spending like some of my colleagues are for, but I'm definitely all about saying, how can we, you know, make our government bureaucracies work better so that, you know, maybe we, you know, it's the 21st century. Maybe 50 years ago we needed job X, but now maybe we need job Y. And right. let's, we need to let's, be fluid about yeah. this stuff. But this is, a, this is another thing was that when the CDPAP cuts came along, they said, you know, talk about jobs, talk about jobs. And these are the people who are putting out the CDPAP for the people. But the point is, it shouldn't be, the focus shouldn't be about jobs, it should be about care. Yeah. And we've lost sight of, but it says, well, the politicians will be motivated when they hear that they're going to lose jobs in their district. And I'm like, what about the care yeah. that's being lost? And this is, we have to change the focus. I agree with you. Look, uh, that's perfectly said. Yeah. What I will say is, from my own personal experience, the difference between um, my mother advocating for me in the early 90s and today, mm -hmm. there's a world of difference. Um, between the skills or between the schools and the opportunities um, and uh, interventions that are out there. And I think that you and Nick, um, you know, you weren't the first, but you definitely are trailblazers in kind of setting that up. And it's going to probably be a mix of advocates, folks with CP and other physical disabilities, 
folks in the legislature all pushing and will probably take multiple different tacks to actually get there. But I mean, I think it's work that we need to continue to do. Um, and hopefully, um, I think your hope and my hope is that for all of these disabilities, it shouldn't have to take advocacy. It shouldn't have to, it should just be commonplace. It should just be there so that when you send your kid to school or you go on the subway, or you go to an office building, you don't have to think about, well, will I be accommodated? Mm -hmm. That the accommodation has already been baked in. And I think between your work, my work, Nick's work, other people's work, I, I think we're moving there. I don't want to sound Pollyannish, but I do think we're moving there. I think we've made progress. I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Okay. I think so, too. But I'm afraid that we could also backslide very badly. And that's what I'm trying to... Well, and I know. agree. That's yeah. why we have to constantly do this. That's why you yeah. can't rest on your laurels. To be a part of a democracy, to be part of a citizen, to be... A, a member of your community, I think you always have to work to make it better. Mm -hmm. I think that'll be true no matter how many victories or failures we have. I mean, I think that's just, that's living in hopefully um, a, a liberal democracy, well, which I hope we still have. <laughs> I hope so too. So I think that's a good time to end it. Thank you so, Thank much, you so much, Bobby. Mike. It was a great talk. Yeah. Um, all of you people at Ability Fierce Land, um, we've got a great show with uh, State Assembly member Robert Carroll. Uh, he's really a great supporter of the disabled. I know this personally, and I think he understands it. He gets it. So we have to elect other representatives who get it. I mean, that's one way to change the, the dynamic. And go and vote. Get involved. Go. I never went to the state assembly office until I needed this help, and I, it was beyond my wildest dreams. I'm not saying everyone's going to help you. But start engaging them. Let them know you're there. Start talking to them. Start telling them your problems, telling them your issues, because that's how we can have an abilities revolution when people, you know, come out and speak and become noticed and are aware. So thank you so much. I'm really honored that uh, State Assembly Member Robert Carroll came out to, to be on this show. And uh, we're going to keep telling it like it is and telling you the, the, the stuff and reporting from the front lines of the uh, covert war on the disabled. And we're going to change the dynamic and we're going to promote an abilities revolution. Thank you.